Hello, friends, and welcome to our video lecture on topics S2.1 and just a little bit of S2.2, models of bonding. We're going to focus a lot today on ionic compounds and covalently bonded molecular compounds. These are our content statements. I'm not going to read them. It's a lot of words. If you want to pause the video and check off that you're learning all these things, feel free. Otherwise, these are our objectives for today. We're going to define covalent bonding. We're going to categorize different types of chemical bonds. We're going to talk about lots of ionic bonds. We're going to talk about those oxidation states, some polyatomic ions, how we name ionic compounds, lattices and lattice energy. This might be a slightly new topic for us. Maybe slow down the video when we get to that part. We're going to talk about some of the properties of ionic compounds. Before we switch over to molecular compounds, we're going to talk about how we name those guys. We're going to compare the bond length and strength of single and double and triple covalent bonds. We're going to draw just a few little structures before we wrap up by looking at the properties of molecular compounds. And let's start by categorizing some chemical bonds. We're going to look at three main categories, metallic bonding, ionic bonding, and then, oh, and this is covalent bonding. We're going to save metallic bonding for its own lecture because metallic bonds are pretty cool. Today we're going to look mostly at ionic bonds and covalent bonds. Ionic bonds for us in IB world, we're going to categorize as having electronegativity differences. That's a shortcut for electronegativity. Electronegativity differences of greater than 1.8. While molecular compounds, these covalently bonded guys, are going to have electronegativity differences between 0 and 1.8. This is IB's cutoff number. Other systems will have slightly different numbers, but for us in IB world, we're going to say that if there is an electronegativity, whoa, electronegativity difference of 1.8 or greater, we're going to call that bond ionic. A smaller electronegativity difference between the two atoms in a compound is going to give us some covalent bonds. If we have a zero difference, that's going to be a purely covalent or nonpolar bond. Then we have these other guys that have smaller differences that ionic, but bigger than nonpolar. We're going to call those guys polar covalent bonds. Please know that this is very much a human endeavor. Some bonds are super ionic and some bonds are super covalent, but a lot of these guys are somewhere in the middle. We humans like to categorize things and so we define a cutoff. And for us in IB world, that cutoff is 1.8. But what even are chemical bonds? They are electrostatic forces of attraction between oppositely charged particles. This is similar to the forces of attraction that hold magnets together, but in magnets we have opposite poles that are attracted to each other. Here in chemical bonds, we have oppositely charged particles that are going to be attracted to each other. In our ionic bonds, we're going to have a positively charged cation that is attracted to a negatively charged anion. Those ions are formed when electrons are transferred. So here we've got a sodium atom. It is going to transfer an electron over to that fluorine atom. That sodium is now a positively charged cation. The fluorine is now fluoride, a negatively charged anion. And these guys will be attracted to each other. It's an electrostatic force of attraction between the cation and the anion. That's an ionic bond. Covalent bonds, what happens is some electrons are shared. Those electrons are negatively charged. The nucleus of each of the atoms that is sharing those electrons, those nuclei are positively charged. And so we have an electrostatic force of attraction between the nucleus of those atoms and then the shared electrons that are between them. So we have a force of attraction here and a force of attraction here, and that's going to hold that whole molecule together. Metallic bonds are weird. Again, they're going to have their very own lecture. What happens in a metallic bond is that these metal atoms are going to release their valence electrons into a sea of free electrons. We call them delocalized because they don't have any specific location. So we're going to have these positive cations, those metal nuclei, and they are going to be electrostatically attracted to 
that C of free or delocalized electrons that are just floating around in a cloud all over the place. They're pretty cool. So again, chemical bonds are electrostatic forces of attraction between oppositely charged particles, and that can be cation anion, or nucleus and shared electrons, or cations and seas of free electrons. We're gonna focus for a little bit on ionic bonds. Remember that ions are charged particles due to a loss or gain of electrons. Sodium here is going to lose that electron. When we take away a thing that is negatively charged, we minus a minus, we get a positive one. So this guy is going to become a cation. It is a positively charged ion produced when an atom loses an electron. Here we're going to have a gaining of that electron. When we add something that is negatively charged, we end up with a negative charge. This guy is an anion. It is negatively charged because of the gaining of an electron. Let's talk about how we can predict if atoms are going to gain or lose electrons. Here we have a Bohr model of sulfur. Notice that it has one, two, three, four, five, six valence electrons. Six valence electrons. And we have this lovely thing called the octet rule. The octet rule, or eight is great, simply states that if we have eight valence electrons and we only count our S, and p electrons, our s and p electrons, are considered our valence electrons. Eight is great. Eight is going to be the most stable because that's what our noble gases have. This is the most energetically favorable. So sulfur is here with six valence electrons, two s's and one, two, three, four p's. To get to eight, it needs to gain one, two more electrons. Or it could try to lose one, two, three, four, five, six. Is it easier to gain two or lose six? It's easier to gain two negatively charged electrons. And so sulfur's oxidation state is most likely going to be a negative two because gaining two electrons is the easiest way to be most energetically favorable, most stable. If we look over here at magnesium, magnesium has one, two, Valence electrons, that's all she's got. So one, two valence electrons, those two S's, those two, three S electrons. Is it easier to gain one, two, three, four, five, six, or lose two? It's way easier to lose two. And that's exactly what magnesium is most likely going to do. By losing those two electrons, the whole entire third energy level is gone. And now our second energy level has two, four, six, eight valence electrons. Magnesium now looks a lot like neon in terms of electron configuration. It is very energetically stable. Magnesium's charge is going to be to lose two electrons that are negatively charged. That's going to give magnesium a charge of positive two. We can predict these charges based on valence electrons. So the uh, group one, the alkali metals, have one valence electron. They're most likely to lose it. They're going to have an oxidation state of plus one. Alkaline earths, plus two. This group, group 13, the boron group, is most often going to be a plus three, but there are lots of exceptions. These guys are super wackadoodle. We're not even going to give them an oxidation state because it's kind of everything. Nitrogen's most common ion is going to be a negative three. Oxygen's group a negative two. The halogen's negative one. And then, of course, our noble gases are not going to want to gain or lose electrons. Their oxidation states are going to be zero. Hydrogen's kind of a quirky guy. He's got his one valence electron, and certainly it could lose that one valence electron and become a positively charged cation. But what's interesting about hydrogen and helium they're in that energy level number one. There's only an S sublevel, and there is space for only two electrons, one orbital, in that S sublevel. And so two is full for energy level number one. Eight is great, except for energy level number one, where two is great. So it would be equally easy for hydrogen to gain an electron and be a negatively charged anion. 
depends on what hydrogen is interacting with, we're going to look quite a bit later on about oxidation states of hydrogen. Perhaps even quirkier than hydrogen are the transition metals. They have variable oxidation states. They can lose different numbers of electrons and be stable. It's related a lot to their ionization energies, those energetically favorable, more stable configurations. Manganese clearly has a lot of choices for stability, as opposed to zinc, which only has this one choice. We're going to show the oxidation state of our transition metals in their names. So when I name iron oxide, to clarify whether we're talking about iron that has a positive two charge or iron that has a positive three charge, we're going to call it iron two oxide, or we could call it iron three oxide. And while we're here, I just want to clarify a little bit about oxidation state versus charge. So these are oxidation states. These are oxidation states. And when we're talking about oxidation states, we are going to put the charge, the sign for the charge in front. So the oxidation state of this iron two is plus two. The oxidation state of this oxygen is going to be negative two. However, when we write the ion in symbolic form, we will often put the sign after the number. So this is a charge and this is an oxidation state and this is a charge, and this is an oxidation state. So just be careful about where you're putting those signs. Polyatomic ions, also quirky. What's happening here is that we have several atoms, hence the polyatom ic ions. We have several atoms that are sharing electrons so these guys are bonded together with a covalent bond. They're sharing a pair of electrons here, and then they work together to go steal another electron, which turns them into ions. There are seven that we need to know. I gave you flashcards for more than seven. You'll need to know lots of them in college chem. For us, these are the seven most important. This is hydroxide. Hydroxide's formula is OH with a negative one charge. Make sure that you know the charges in addition to the formulae. The others that we need to know are ammonium, which has a formula of NH4 and a plus one charge, nitrate NO3 with a negative one charge, hydrogen carbonate, which is hydrogen literally in front of carbonate. It has a negative one charge, whereas carbonate without the hydrogen is CO3 with a minus two charge. Sulfate is SO4, also a negative two charge, and phosphate PO4 and a negative three charge. Make sure that you have those memorized. We name ionic compounds by stating the name of the metal cation first, and then we're going to name the non-metal ion after it. We're going to change its name to ide, unless it's a polyatomic ion, in which case it just keeps its name. So here, potassium, and then we're going to change chlorine to chloride, sodium, and we're going to change oxygen to oxide. Silver is a transition metal, so we're going to give it a Roman numeral plus one charge. Silver is pretty much always plus one, so you don't necessarily have to always add it, but it's not bad if you do. And then fluorine is going to become fluoride. Here we've got some calcium, and then this is our polyatomic ion, carbon eight. We don't change the end of the polyatomic ion to ide, it gets to keep its name. To go from the name to a formula, we need to check our charges. So sodium has an oxidation state of charge of plus one. Fluorine, becoming fluoride, has a charge of negative one. These guys are going to balance each other out. That balance, that overall neutral charge, is most energetically stable. And so sodium fluoride's formula is going to be one sodium to one fluoride, NaF. Magnesium chloride, magnesium's oxidation state, its charge is a plus two, whereas chloride is only a negative one. If I had MgCl, 
that plus two minus one is going to give the whole particle, this whole unit, a, an overall charge of plus one, which is not energetically stable. If I add a second chloride, now I have two negative ones and negative one, negative one, and positive two, this is neutral, and this is going to be our formula. Iron three oxide, remember that that Roman numeral tells us the charge of this iron, so iron's charge here is a plus three, oxygen is going to be a negative two. These guys don't balance out. We're gonna figure out what is the least common denominator, our least common multiple, for these two guys. Um, six is our number. So what do I need to multiply iron by to get to six? Well, three times two is six. What do I need to multiply two by to get to six? Oh, times three, three times two is six. So now I have two times positive three is a positive six. Three times negative two is a negative six, and we're going to balance out. A little bit of a shortcut here. Notice that that three is now there and that two got flipped over there. So we can also just trade those charges for subscripts. One more, let's look at aluminum hydroxide. Aluminum is Al with a positive three charge. Hydroxide is our polyatomic ion, it has a negative one charge. I have a negative one, I have a positive three. I need three of these guys to balance out that positive three charge. If I write ALOH3, this implies that I only have three hydrogens, and in fact, I want three hydroxides. So we're gonna put that whole thing into parentheses. Our formula for aluminum hydroxide, ALOH in parentheses, three. Ionic compounds are pretty cool in that they form lattices, not individual molecules. We don't have just one single sodium and one single chloride making a salt sodium chloride molecule that doesn't happen instead we have these super cool continuous three-dimensional networks of repeating units these are lattices and so we're going to go sodium chloride sodium chloride sodium chloride sodium chloride it's just going to keep going and going and going um, until the crystal gets so big that it cracks or we humans do something to smash it up into smaller pieces we have this continuous network, three-dimensional. This is different from when we talk about our molecules, which will be individual pieces, not these lattices. Kind of a cool thing about the energy that is holding those pieces, those ions together, is going to be called our lattice energy, and it depends on the size of our ions and the charges of our ions. If I have pretty small ions, the distance between them is going to be small. There's going to be a stronger force of attraction. The bond is going to be a stronger ionic bond. If I've got some big ions involved in these lattices, we're going to have more distance between them. That's going to weaken the force of attraction. The bond is going to be weaker. If I have charges that are larger, so this aluminum has a plus three charge, this is going to cause a stronger force of attraction. We're going to have a stronger ionic bond. Table 16 in our data booklet gives us some of those lattice energies, enthalpies. Um, we can figure out that the lattice energy or enthalpy for lithium fluoride is 1,049. Whereas for lithium iodide, it's only 764. And that's because lithium and fluorine are pretty small. Lithium and iodine, iodine's pretty big. That's going to weaken that force of attraction. That's going to have an impact on the properties of these compounds. Notice that the melting point of lithium iodide is quite a bit lower than is the melting point of lithium fluoride. That's because this guy has a stronger lattice energy. This guy has a weaker bond, a lower lattice energy. Here, we're gonna throw in that super cool plus three aluminum ion. Oh my gosh, its melting point is gigantic because that charge of plus three is greater than that charge of only plus one. And since we're talking about some properties of ionic compounds, let's talk about more properties of ionic compounds. 
Ionic compounds tend to be non-volatile. That means they do not go into gaseous state or vaporize very easily. It is hard to turn sodium chloride salt into a gas. They are often, but not always, but often soluble in water. This happens because we have those negative positive charges. Water is a little bit polar. The negative side of the water molecule is going to be attracted to the positive cation. The positive side of the water molecule is going to be attracted to the negative anion. And then these water molecules can just form these little bubbles around the separate ions, dissolving the ionic compound. If, however, the lattice energy, the force of attraction between the ions, is greater than the force of attraction to the water molecules, then it won't be soluble in water. So ionic compounds, many are soluble in water, but not all. Ionic compounds are going to be non-conductive as solids, but they will be conductive when they are melted and when they are, if they are, dissolved in water. This is because electrical conductivity depends on the movement of electrons. And when we have these um, ions in solid form, when they're in their lattices, these particles are stuck in place. They're not moving. But if I can dissolve them or melt them, then these guys can move. And if we can get our ions with their electrons to move, then we can have some conductivity. Ionic bonding done. Let's flip over to some covalent bonding. We're going to focus just on molecular compounds. We're going to save covalent network solids for later. Molecular compounds can come in a nonpolar and a polar version. Nonpolar are going to have no difference in their electronegativities, whereas polar bonds are going to have some difference, but not greater than a 1.8 difference in their electronegativities. And a quick review of some covalent nomenclature. How do we name covalently bonded molecular compounds? We use some prefixes. We do not use prefixes in ionic nomenclature. We do use these prefixes in covalent nomenclature. So this guy is called carbon monoxide. Monoxide because there's only one oxygen. This guy is carbon dioxide. Di because there's two oxygens. This guy is dinitrogen monoxide. We always, always, always put a prefix on the second element in our covalent formulae. We put a prefix on the first element only if there's more than one. If there's only one of the first element, we can skip the prefix. We don't have to say monocarbon monoxide. So we can skip the prefix if there's only one of the first guy. But if there's only one of the second guy, we need to include that prefix. This guy, four is a quirky one. Four is tetra. So this one's going to be tetraphosphorus deck oxide. Notice that we're going to change the name of the second guy to Ide at the end. The first one is going to keep its normal name. And this is how we name molecular compounds. These covalent bonds are all about sharing electrons. And then we have an electrostatic force of attraction between the nucleus of one atom and the cloud of shared electrons that are negatively charged. That's that electrostatic force of attraction that's holding these molecules together. Kind of a cool thing, we can share just one pair of electrons. So the dot is showing that this is one of oxygen's electrons, the X is hydrogen's electron. So we can see that each of these guys contributed one electron to this pair of shared electrons, and this is a covalent bond. We're gonna call it a single bond because there's only one pair of electrons being shared. Here at carbon dioxide, Oxygen is actually contributing two electrons, as is carbon. So this one's going to be a double bond. There are four total electrons being shared. This nitrogen gas molecule, oh my goodness, it's a triple bond. We have one, two, three bonds. Each one of those lines is representing a pair of shared electrons. And so this triple bond is actually two, four, six electrons being shared. That's a lot of electrons in that bond. 
And because there are so many electrons in those triple bonds, they're crazy strong. Triple bonds or bonds with bond order of three are going to be quite short because again, there's two, four, six electrons in there. That's a big negative cloud. And then those positively charged nuclei are quite strongly attracted to all of those electrons. So we're going to have a small bond length, only 120 picometers for that bond length. And then the energy stored in that bond is quite high, 839 kilojoules per moles of those bonds. If I look at only a double bond between carbon to four electrons being shared, the length is longer because the force of attraction is not quite as strong because there's only negative four things in that cloud. And the strength is a little bit less, again, because it's longer and less strong. If we go to just a single bond, only two lonely electrons floating around, the force of attraction between the nuclei and those that one shared pair of electrons, it's quite weak. And so there's only 347 kilojoules of energy stored per mole of this bond. And it's longer because again, they're not getting pulled in toward each other quite as strongly. It's a big 147 picometers of bond length. We're going to draw just a few Lewis dot structures here together. We're going to do lots and lots of practice for this in class. I do have some steps here. You do not necessarily have to follow exactly these steps, but it's nice to have a starting place if you haven't drawn these before. We need to have the sum of all the valence electrons of all the atoms in our molecules. We're going to choose our central atom. The central atom is going to be often carbon. It's never going to be hydrogen. It's never going to be a halogen. It's going to be the atom that can share the most electrons in the group that we're looking at. We're going to, after we choose those central atoms, we're going to arrange the other atoms around the central guy. Then we're going to put pairs of shared electrons between the atoms. Once we have pairs between all of them, we're going to go ahead and distribute the remaining valence electrons to give all of the atoms full octets. If I run out of electrons before everybody has a full octet, we're going to go back and make some double or triple bonds. So what does that look like? We're going to sum up our valence electrons. Carbon has four valence electrons. Each of these hydrogens has one. One times four is a total of four. Four plus four is eight. We have eight total valence electrons to work with in making the Lewis structure for this guy, carbon tetrahydride. We never put hydrogen in the middle. So I'm going to put carbon as my central atom. I'm going to arrange those hydrogens around the carbon. And then we're going to start with some pairs of shared electrons between the atoms in our molecule. So we start with our pairs. I have now drawn eight electrons. I only had eight electrons to work with. We're done. And this is good because notice that carbon here has two four, six, eight total electrons, full octet. Hydrogen has, oh no, only two. But we talked about this. This is good because hydrogen only has energy level number one with only sublevel s and there's only one orbital. So there's only space for two electrons. So hydrogen here is also as stable as it can be because it's energy level number one. This is done, Lewis structure for carbon tetrahydride. We're going to learn when we get to orgo that this is also called methane. Let's talk about this guy, NH3, nitrogen trihydride, also known as ammonia. We never, ever, ever put hydrogen in the middle. I'm going to put nitrogen in the middle. We're going to put our hydrogens around. Notice that I'm doing my steps out of order. That's okay. We're going to take our nitrogens, five valence electrons. Hydrogen each has one. There are three of them. So one times three plus five gives us eight electrons once again. We're going to put those electrons in pairs between the atoms. There's two, four, six. I have two more electrons to put on the molecule. Where should I put them? Do I want to give them to hydrogen or hydrogen or hydrogen? No, because hydrogen has a full octet duet. So where should I put that last pair of electrons to get to eight? 
we're going to give them to nitrogen. And this is brilliant because look now at nitrogen. It has two, four, six, eight full octet. This is our Lewis dot structure for NH3. What about CO3 with a minus two charge? What's that? That's our polyatomic ion carbonate. So this one's interesting. Carbon has its four valence electrons. Oxygen has six. There are three of them. That's 18. So should I work with 22 valence electrons? No, because this guy stole two more. So I'm going to add another two electrons from that negative two charge. So four plus 18 plus two, we actually have 24 total electrons to work with. Carbon's going to go in the middle. Oxygen's going to go around the carbon. We're going to start by putting pairs of electrons between our atoms. Two, four, six. So now I've got a lot more electrons. I need to give everybody some full octets. Here's eight. Oxygen is not an energy level number one. Oxygen needs eight electrons. So here's 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24. Oh no, we have run out of electrons. And this oxygen does not yet have eight electrons. So what we're going to do is actually take this pair away from carbon and we're going to make a double bond. So now this oxygen has two, four, six, eight, and this oxygen has two, four, six, eight, and this oxygen has two, four, six, eight. And this carbon also has two, four, six, eight. Everybody's happy. We have a double bond in here. When we run out of electrons, and not everybody has that full octet yet, we might need to go back and make some double or triple bonds. All right, let's do one more example together. Boron trihydride. We're going to put boron in the middle because hydrogen is never, ever, ever in the middle. Boron has three valence electrons. Hydrogen each has one times three. That gives us a total of six electrons. We're going to put them between our atoms. Two, four, six. Oh no, I've run out of electrons. What can I do? Make a double bond? How would I do that? Like that? That's no bueno. That, what? What are we going to do? Actually, we're going to say that's good enough. Weird, right? So here's the thing about some of our elements, especially things like boron, which is kind of metalish, but not super metalish. Is it sharing? Is it stealing? Who even knows? We're going to allow it to have what we call an incomplete octet. Boron had three. Now it has six. Six is more stable than three. It's electron deficient, but we're going to go with it. There are some exceptions to our octet rule. Boron is an exception that you should have memorized. Last little bit here, we're going to talk about some properties of molecular compounds, and then my friends, we are done. So volatility, remember that this is the ability to vaporize. So molecular compounds, especially those that are less polar, have smaller electronegativity differences between their atoms. They are more likely to be volatile. So nonpolar covalent molecules are going to be quite volatile. They are often gases at room temperature because they vaporize pretty easily. Things that are more polar, things that have bigger electronegativity differences, polar covalent compounds are going to be a little bit less volatile. Solubility in water, the more polar they are, because water is also polar, the more soluble they're going to be. Things that are quite nonpolar, those nonpolar bonds that can lead to nonpolar molecules are going to be a little bit less soluble. So we're talking about things like oil. Oil, not super soluble in water because it's quite nonpolar. Our molecular compounds tend to be non-conductive. So remember that electrical conductivity is all about moving electrons. And when we have something like water, those electrons are stuck between atoms. They cannot move. There isn't going to be any electrical conductivity because we don't have delocalized movable 
charged particles, electrons, or ions. We are going to talk about some gigantic exceptions to a lot of these properties in our next lecture when we talk about covalent network solids. But for molecules, these are generally our properties. And my friends, on that note, we have accomplished all of our objectives. There are a lot. I'm not going to read them. Feel free to pause uh, and think about these. Make sure that you did achieve those objectives. Review any pieces that you feel like you didn't actually learn. Um, and until next time, great work today.